Welcome everyone uh, to Buddhist Center. So good to see all of you. Uh, now everybody's on, so good to see all of you. Uh, thank you uh, for spending some time uh, tonight to listen to the Dharma. Once again, we're looking at Lama Tsongkhapa's Foundation of All Good Qualities or the Source of All My Good as it's entitled in the text that we actually look at. I like the way that this text flows in terms of poetry. Uh, so I've chosen to use this particular translation, but there are other more technical translations out there uh, and that those translations are called the Foundation of All Good Qualities. But Lama Tsongkhapa uh, making this like a poem, I feel that in the spirit of that, uh, it's nice to look at it in terms of poetry, uh, and I like this particular translation, but, uh, you know, I, I really just rejoice in all of the work that these incredible translators have done at all of the different levels in order for us to be able to understand any uh, aspect of the Dharma, uh, and so many texts were translated that now allow us to understand the meaning uh, of, uh, you know, the kind of intricate points of the Dharma, uh, that we would have never been able to understand if we didn't have these devoted translators who spent so much time, you know, working at a desk and refining and refining these translations. So first of all, I just want to say thank you so much to all the great translators out there and all of the different styles of translators out there uh, that make teachings like this possible. And uh, I did oral translation, as you know, but oral translation compared to, you know, you know, can translating an entire text word for word in a literal sense and making it uh, something that is like, a, you know, glasses for the whole world uh, to be able to see the ultimate truth with uh, is, is a very, very big venture uh, that I would never want to try to compare myself to, uh, but I tried to uh, contribute what I could uh, to the proliferation of the Dharma and to the advancement of our understanding of the Lam Rim tradition uh, while I was translating for Rinpoche. Uh, so uh, tonight we're looking at that text that we've looked at so many times with Rinpoche, uh, and we've been going over it for quite some time, quite a few sessions now, uh, using uh, uh, Pabunka Rinpoche's uh, very small commentary, which has a nice outline uh, and gives us some really key points uh, that uh, help us to understand how to extract the full meaning uh, out of each and one, of, each and every one of these stanzas. And now, of course, Pabunka Rinpoche's small commentary isn't enough to give us the full understanding of what this text is presenting. Uh, it helps us to see more of what it's abbreviating. But we really are we 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 would need to look at L Laman Tsongkhapa's great treatise on the stages of the path to enlightenment as well as the great treatise on the stages of the tantric path to enlightenment to truly get at. Uh, what Lama Tsongkhapa is, is presenting in this text in a holistic way. Uh, but we're going to do our best to use Pabunka's outline and his small commentary, uh, as we've been doing, and combine it with parts of the Great Treatise on the Stage of the Path to Enlightenment and other texts by you know, various Dalai Lamas uh, and the great authors of the Nalanda tradition that can help uh, support uh, what you know, is contained uh, by Lama Tsongkhapa in these small stanzas, because Lama Tsongkhapa is always uh, trying to elucidate the pathways uh, of those great trailblazers of the extensive deeds and the profound view lineage, uh, lineage of blessings and so forth. Those incredible uh, teachings that were integrated uh, by Lord Atisha um, uh, in the Lamp for the Path to Enlightenment. And when he came to Tibet to help show how all of these teachings weren't contradictory and they were really just instructions for practice and instructions for varying individuals and they were all necessary at some point for an individual to go from non-enlightened uh, to the full enlightenment of a Buddha uh, and it's incredible uh, that we have these works that you know uh, either Lama Tsongkhapa is commenting on uh, or are commenting on Lama Tsongkhapa uh, that you know, depending on which direction in history we go, if we go after Lama Tsongkhapa, they're, you know, the texts are commenting on Lama Tsongkhapa or acting as ornaments to what we see Lama Tsongkhapa writing. And before that, uh, we see, you know, there are texts that, you know, when Lama Tsongkhapa came to Tibet, obviously there was Nyingma Kaju and Sakya, there wasn't Galupa. So we see the influence of all of those teachings and then the Indian pandits that he really, really tried to focus on so dearly uh, uh, to understand looking at, you know, the golden uh, rosary where he comments on the Abhisama Alamkara 
uh, Maitreya's uh, um, incredible text uh, that a Sangha brought into this world where we understand the grounds and paths. Uh, and he did so much work related to Madhyamaka uh, by commenting on texts like uh, the Mulya Madhyamika Karikta by Nagarjuna, which we have in, in English, the, uh, um, what is it, the Ocean of, of Wisdom, uh, Ripijatso, and then his commentary on the uh, Chandrakirti's middle uh, Madhyamika Avatara that we have uh, illuminating the intent that just came out recently. We're so fortunate uh, to have these commentaries in our world. We have the Garasparam's translation of the Golden Rosary, the commentary on Abhisama Lankara. We have Jay Garfield's translation of the Ocean of Wisdom, the commentary on the Mulya Madhyamika Karika. Uh, and then we have Tupin Jimba's translation of, of uh, the uh, Laman Tsongkhapa's commentary on Chandrakirti's Madhyamika Avatara uh, called Illuminating the Intent. So, and then we have the uh, Essence of Eloquence that's been translated as well. Uh, it, you know, the Laman Tsongkhapa's editions where he uh, explains and negates uh, so many other views and so forth related to uh, being able to land on the Madhyamika Prasangika view of emptiness. So uh, I just really, really think we're so fortunate uh, to have not only heard these names, heard of these beings, like, oh, oh I've heard of them. Uh, we've actually, you know, worked with their texts. Uh, Rinpoche has given us, Kensuke Geshe Wanda gave us the transmission of so many of these important texts. And now it's our job to take the blessing of that translation, tra uh, transmission uh, and the wisdom that we have arisen from learning and hearing, right? you know, because Rinpoche is holding the Dalai Lama, now Geshe Doji Damdu, uh, and before Geshe Lopsang Gompo, all these great teachers, uh, they explained these things to us, they gave us transmissions, and now it's our turn to engage in, in analysis so we can have that wisdom that arises from analysis. Uh, so it, we can, you know, have this wisdom that arises from hearing all we want uh, and compile a lot of information in our mind and stack it up, you know, and make it so we can't even see over the top of the books in our mind. <laughs> There's so much information in there. Uh, but if we then don't take that information and really analyze it and really put it into our kind of daily mental perspective about things, uh, then it just kind of remains there as information. Uh, and if you believe that the information that's there is correct, uh, it doesn't mean if it is correct, that you will remain there believing that it is. Uh, and if you don't really penetrate this ma material by going over it over and over again, almost to the point of ad nauseum sometimes in your mind, if you don't go over it over and over again and look at it from every single aspect, like Lama Tsongkhapa says, you know, you're you know, taking some subject and you're looking at it in every single different way possible. You saw, find this in Pabunka Rinpoche's commentary also. You're looking at it every single way possible until it becomes so concrete uh, that there's nothing to really reason it out about it because it's so clearly, solidly understood in your mind uh, by use of correct signs, that there's no further you can go with it in terms of maturing your understanding of it, in terms of realizing it, in terms of taking it, it you know, with respect to the topics at the beginning of the Lam Rim, in terms of making th those topics the kind of states of mind that you abide in day and night. You know, this idea at the, in the source of all my good, Pabunko Rinpoche's commentary, uh, says that, you know, Lama Tsongkhapa's kid keeps saying, bless me to see clearly, bless me to understand that from this moment on, uh, I should think that this foundation of all my qualities, the source of all of my good is my teacher. Before I thought a whole lot of other things were the source of all of my good, source of all of my happiness. But now I see that the foundation of all of my excellence, the foundation of everything good that I could possibly become, the foundation of every single sort of happiness I could have uh, and every single suffering that I could get rid of is the teacher. And without analysis in, into that subject and penetrating it, there's no way you will, when you read that verse that says the source of all my good is my kind Lama, my Lord, etc., that you will know that that has penetrated your mind in such a way that it's just, of course, 
It's just, it's something that's so clear to you and you would go about your daily life in following the instructions that your teacher has given you. Uh, it, it kind of goes from that realization that you could have day and night about the foundation of all good qualities and thinking about how you would serve you know, through thought and action, a Lama, if the Lama is still here, but still serving in thought and action if your Lama is passed on, because we know the Lama is inseparable from the Yidam. We know that we meditate on the deity, and we know that the Lama is just a manifestation of the Buddha who can emanate in so many different forms. Uh, so we learn, even if our Lama has passed on, how to rely on thought, rely on the Lama in thought and action, even whatever form they're in, whether they're in a form like an emanation body form, or who knows, you know, maybe they're emanating another body somewhere else, or they're, you know, in the Sambhokaya form with those five excellent qualities that comes from the Dharmakaya, uh, that has the excellent qualities of, of emptiness and being free from the defilements and omniscience and all of that good stuff uh, that then in, in this great compassion that forces on you know, the world of sentient beings, an enjoyment body, and then an emanation body. So we know uh, if our teachers are who we've meditated on them to be, looking at it in terms of an integrated path, and I'm not saying that we see anyone who's ever given us a Dharma instruction as a Buddha. If we can, and we can see purity like that, that's fantastic. Um, but really getting to that level takes a lot of maturation, takes a lot of analysis, takes a lot of teachings from that Lama, takes a lot of watching that Lama and seeing how they act and behave uh, and don't act and behave. Uh, and then as you move towards the, you know, the, the tantric path, it becomes really important to kind of see the Lama in that aspect as the manifestation of the Buddha. The Buddha doesn't need a go-between. The Buddha doesn't need to send others. The Buddha can emanate a body uh, if there is a, uh, it's said, if there is a pool to reflect the moon, the moon can reflect. Uh, so if there is a condition there present or a being who needs help from a Buddha, a Buddha will appear uh, because the Buddha has love for all sentient beings uh, and the Buddha can emanate an emanation body uh, and emanate a bridge if someone needs to cross a river, if there's a need for them to do that to get closer to enlightenment. The Buddha can somehow create even a circumstance like that for beings because of the love and compassion uh, that he or she has and the omniscience that he or she has related to all sentient beings. And if that sentient being has the condition, has some sort of karma to be able to meet with the teacher, uh, then they have like the, the water that serves as a reflection of the moon. So that moon can reflect just like the Buddha's image can reflect into our world, into our lives and emanate and then become teachers like in our lives, like his holiness, the Dalai Lama, who we say is the Buddha of compassion. The Buddha of compassion can only emanate to those and can only teach those who have the conditions proper, the karma proper to receive teachings from a being like that. Believe that that, that, that teacher is saying something that's good uh, believing that that teacher is worthy of being listened to. There's a lot of teachers out there. So it takes a lot of karma from our side. It takes our condition to be present for the teacher to teach. So if His Holiness the Dalai Lama is the Buddha of compassion, in order for us to receive teachings from the Buddha of compassion, we have to have the conditions, the karma, uh, to be able to meet with these teachers. And we don't know when that karma will lose its power and then that, when that karma loses its power, the teacher leaves the world. Now, uh, we have to look at everything as dependent origination, not blaming ourselves, uh, but we have to look at everything as dependent origination. So the time is right now where we can study with some of these teachers that are still in our world, and we should really take advantage of it. Because although we can still pray to our teachers every single day, I connect multiple times, maybe every hour, with Kensu Geshe Wandak in a way, and being so grateful for the teachings and knowing what an impact it's had on my life. Um, but what I'm referring back to is when we were together and I know how powerful uh, those moments are. So if we have those potential moments now with other teachers like His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Geshe Doji Namdu, Humzala Geshe Aga, Geshe Mala Tenzin Ladrin, people like Jeffrey Hopkins, we have a chance to be able to be in the actual physical presence of or study with 
even if it's on Zoom, these beings, we should really take advantage of it because we have this human basis right now uh, that we can take advantage of it with. And that I think leads us pretty well into us just getting into uh, uh, the seven point Virakana posture. We've got a little bit of motivation set, a little bit of understanding set. We're so fortunate to know that we have all of these teachings. We have the Lam Rim, which are the stages of the path that go all the way to that sp supreme state of Buddhahood. Uh, they don't have anything mixed up. The order is exactly in the way that it needs to be. And, and it can show someone like me who needs to be explained things in very simplistic ways over and over and over and over again, how to proceed through the stages of the path so that I could actually get the foundational realizations or building blocks upon which to go from this state to a little bit better, to a little bit better, to a little bit better, to the best, uh, to better, to better, to better, to best, best being Buddhahood, being, you know, but the bodhisattvas are pretty darn good. <laughs> Once you achieve, you know, uh, renunciation, and then from that renunciation can generate bodhicitta, those beings are so incredibly, uh, uh, you know, holy, uh, and their realizations and their abilities are just spe spectacular, uh, what those bodhisattvas can do, uh, but they still can't do everything that a Buddha can do. So we'll go through those stages where we can do spectacular things, where we are completely holy beings, but we're still pointing our, our eyes at, we're, we're looking at the final goal of Buddhahood, so we can be the best, the most spectacular, the most perfect being in the universe, the most reliable guide with perfect wisdom, perfect love, perfect compassion, perfect skillful means, and perfect power to help sentient beings in every single way that they need to be helped if they have the conditions that are right for you to be able to help them. And the more that we in our meditations connect with different sentient beings and pray for different sentient beings, we're creating those future connections with them so that we can connect with them when we're Buddhas as completely reliable guides to truly, truly help them and free them from their miseries. And if we uh, aren't so lucky and they become Buddhas before us, we're connecting with them for them to be able to help us. Uh, so it's a win-win when we look at it in terms of dependent origination and we look at how this stuff really works. We look at how this isn't just some fairy tale fantasy that we're talking about that sounds good uh, and it's philosophical jargon that we can debate about in universities and, you know, uh, squabble, you know, over the, it's not for that point. Uh, the point of it is, is to transform our minds in a way that actually works to apply antidotes to our afflictions that actually work, to apply the final antidote to our afflictions, which is getting rid of the self-grasping ignorance by, realize, by the wisdom that realizes the emptiness of inherent existence of all phenomena. Uh, so uh, in order for us uh, to uh, do any of that, in order for us to mature our minds along the way, to move through those stages, in order for us to uh, um, be able to become incredible renunciates, become incredible bodhisattvas, become Buddhas, we have to use the mirror of the Dharma to know exactly where we're at. We have to calm our minds down enough so that we're realistic and honest with ourselves and can say, yes, this is where I'm really at. We can calm ourselves down enough in the morning to look at, you know, or in the night, whenever we can do our practices, any time is great, whenever you can do it, whenever you can find that pocket of time to calm our minds down enough and say, am I really meeting my expectations? Am I meeting my teacher's expectations? Am I really, really engaging in a pathway in, in a real way that will produce the results I'm looking for? I, I don't want to have suffering. I, I'm convinced of that over and over again. I really like happiness. I'm convinced of that over and over and over again. And the Buddha has given me a clear track uh, to freedom from suffering where I don't have any fears and to complete happiness or bliss. The Buddha has given me a complete track to that. How is my behavior tallying with <laughs> that track? Is my behavior, is my mental behavior, my intention that's then you know, moving my body and speech around How's that doing? How, how is my body and speech action, karma doing? 
And if we don't quiet ourselves down enough to be able to say, okay, all right, look at the stages of the path, look at what's going to be necessary to have fearlessness and bliss, and, 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 and then say, am I really doing these things? Am I really studying enough to understand emptiness? Am I really meditating on bodhicitta enough? Am I really improving the amount of, you know, am I increasing the amount of beings that I can relate to in my bodhicitta practice? Am I doing that? And, and, or is it just this stagnant thing where I'm imagining these, you know, beings that I don't even know who they are that are on Pluto, as I say, because they're a lot easier to deal with than people we actually deal with. And then imagining I'm doing all this great stuff for them. But for some reason, it's not really changing my mind. It's not really making me sit down on my cushion and see this universe in such a much more vast fashion. Is that happening? Is my world, is my mental world, is my getting bigger? You know, I've seen a lot of things and I can go a lot of places, but is my mind increasing in terms of what it's penetrating? And when I say what it's penetrating, I mean, you know, sentient beings uh, that are impermanent, that are empty. You know, how am I doing with them? And how am I doing with, while I'm doing that, seeing the emptiness of the action, the emptiness of the agent, and the emptiness of the object? How am I doing when I'm relating in my meditation uh, to those spheres of reality, you know, these spheres of action, agent, and object? Am I seeing myself as this incredible person that inherently exists that's, you know, meditating on these great things? You know, am I seeing the sentient beings as inherently existent that I'm doing these great things for that aren't even impermanent? Am I seeing them like that? Am I seeing them just as these suffering beings that aren't impermanent or now aren't empty? How am I seeing this? Am I seeing the activity of my meditation as empty of inherent existence? Am I seeing that? Am I, is my meditation getting bigger? And it, is it relating in a bigger way in terms of now, not only am I relating to all of these more and more sentient beings in terms of wanting to have happiness and the causes of happiness and be free from suffering and the causes of suffering and taking it upon myself, the task of freeing them all. Not only am I relating to them in that way, but is my mind in terms of emptiness in relation to that meditation also increasing uh, because if we are not duly meditating on bodhicitta and emptiness or i would say renunciation bodhicitta and emptiness then we are not going to be able to get to the destination we won't be able to get to buddhahood we can meditate on emptiness and we can have every single realization related to emptiness that you could ever imagine but if we don't meditate on bodhicitta, we cannot achieve the state of Buddhahood. We see this, you know, in, in, in so many different texts. But if we only meditate upon bodhicitta and don't meditate upon emptiness, we can meditate on love and compassion and become, you know, the most altruistic beings in the, that, that we could become without emptiness. You know, I would argue that you can't become that altruistic without emptiness. I would, I would argue that, you know, you, it becomes difficult uh, to really, really, you know, have that pure, pure state of altruism. Uh, it really starts to need that understanding of emptiness to get the great compassion, uh, to get that, you know, that largest level of compassion that it, it talks about uh, in the text. So, how am I doing when I sit down? Is it changing or am I just trying to bang something out because I said, tomorrow I'm going to meditate for 30 minutes. Tomorrow I'm going to meditate for an hour. So am I watching a clock or am I watching my mind? <laughs> am I watching what my mind's doing in relation to these stages that are placed before us by great beings like Lord Buddha, the Indian pandits, and the great masters like Lama Tsongkhapa and Jayan Sheba, Basu Chuji Jetson, Gunju Jimmy Wampo, Jayan Rupi Dorje, Seventh Dalai Lama, et cetera, and Joseph Ben Kirchup, all these incredibly holy beings, Bhutan and Chintru, all these incredible beings who've elucidated this stuff uh, for us to understand. Uh, it, it, we're so fortunate. So let's get into the seven point Virakana posture. I won't go on 
uh, any more about, you know, motivation uh, and, and just Dharma practice in general. But I think it's important that we really look at every part, every word, whether it's a biography and we're using it to uplift our minds, a biography of a past pandit, we're using it to uplift our minds to move it towards the Dharma. Or if it's on wisdom, we're trying to make our minds sharper to you know, move it towards the Dharma. We should really be looking at everything that the Buddha presented, that Lama Tsongkhapa presented, Chandrakirti, all these people presented as instructions to practice, as it says in that second part of the greatness of the teaching in Lama Tsongkhapa's great treatise of the stage of the path to enlightenment. These are all instructions to practice. And if we're looking at them as information, we're looking at them as just neat or something that we can maybe talk about in a coffee shop, uh, then we're missing the real point because this is supposed to uproot our afflictions. Uh, so every day that we look at this material, is it working? Is it uprooting our afflictions? And it's not going to just uproot them all at once, but you know who you are and you know if you're seeing subtle changes, if you're meditating daily, if you're practicing daily, if you're engaging in Dharma practice daily, you'll, you'll know, you'll be able to have a gauge. You may feel yourself falling back, but that's great. You noticed it. <laughs> you, if you weren't meditating, you wouldn't notice it. And that in itself is advancement. The, the moving backwards is part of advancement to move forward, to see that maybe that solid, great state I thought I could get into was just a fleeting thing. And I don't have enough foundation uh, like I thought I did. I don't have as much as I thought I did. I need to move back, focus on this again, and then hopefully I can gain more consistency. So when you see some sort of, you know, like when we're you know, saying we're getting in the seven point virakana posture, we're breathing in and out, we're counting the breath and we're doing this and that. If you start doing this on a daily basis, you'll have off days. Uh, but those off days just tell you that you need to keep reinforcing that visualization and get it to the point where you achieve uh, shamatha. So seven point virakana posture, I won't go over what that is. Uh, we've done it so many times and I've gone over it in so many different videos all over the place. So we can look that up later on if you're not accustomed to it. Just try to get your back into the most straight posture as possible with vertebrae like a stack of coins, it, it says. Uh, and we're gonna begin breathing through the nose, uh, breathing in through the nose, filling our lungs and diaphragm, and then gently turning the breath around and exhaling. Uh, and then counting one. So we're going to be doing cycles of breath and where mind is going to be focused on those cycles of breath and the counting. We're not going to be counting on the beginning. We're telling our minds exactly what to do. And it's really important when you engage in this kind of meditation that you come up with what you're telling your mind to do and you make sure it does it. <laughs> this is the name of the game around here. You know, it starts right at the beginning of the Lam Rim Chemo in the meditation session where it says, okay, now it's time to tell your mind what to do exactly. Your mind just does whatever it wants usually and to get it under control is going to uh, require you to watch it a little bit and harness it back in uh, with mindfulness when it gets out of control. Uh, so we're gonna be breathing in and out and counting the cycles of breath. And then we're gonna add a fourth thing because breathing in one, breathing out two, counting three, fourth thing, focal object. And that's gonna be Buddha Shakyamuni. Beautiful and radiant, front generation form, about eye height, about the size of our thumb, beautiful and radiant, but static. A static image that we're imagining in our mind at this space, just right about here uh, in front of us. Uh, so if you don't know what Buddha Shakyamuni looks like, uh, he's right here behind my head with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Uh, right below him, uh, but you can visual, visualize whatever deity you normally visualize. If you use a different uh, visualization for your calm abiding practice, shamatha practice, uh, or if the front generation form of Buddha Shakyamuni serves, it's just too much uh, for you to focus on or multitask with these different objects, then just focus on the breathing in and out and the counting. This is about decreasing our conceptuality and getting our minds to a more realistic state in terms of what we're trying to do today. But this exercise taken into your daily meditation practice uh, is something that you would use, such as the breathing in and out and the counting, or just the you know visual, visualizing a static image of a Buddha. Uh, you would use, and you would use the same exact object every single time in your personal meditation, whatever that object is, 
uh, every single time using the same exact object without changing it in any way. Uh, and you would take that object all the way through the nine stages of shamatha uh, to where you get actual calm abiding. Uh, so you would use the same exact object every single day. You don't want to change your objects. It's really important. Uh, they say if you're trying to gain shamatha that you don't change your objects. But here we're just practicing. We're just doing some exercises, like we're doing our exercise, our push-ups, our sit-ups. We're doing some different things to try and make our mind a little bit more pliable, a little lighter, uh, so that we can hear the Dharma right, so we don't have any of the faults of the three pots uh, and that we can move forward uh, from this class with more wisdom and more stuff to analyze. Okay, so seven point Virakana posture, breathing in and out and counting in Buddha Shakyamuni. so fortunate to have this human basis and to have met with the Dharma, to know who Buddha Shakyamuni is, to have heard of the three turnings of the wheel of Dharma. We know of the Four Noble Truths. We're so fortunate. We know of the Sutra of the Heart of Transcendent Knowledge, the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras that teach that final view of emptiness. We know about the third turning of the wheel of Dharma, and the understanding of Buddha nature, We're so fortunate, an interpretable teaching where we find so much gold. Now imagine that from Buddha Shakyamuni, Buddha Shakyamuni now turns in, into an animated form. So happy, smiling, radiant. So just pleased that we're here tonight, uh, engaging in something that will fulfill his wishes, and that's that all sentient beings become Buddhas. So we're engaging in exactly that because what we all need to do is what Buddha Shakyamuni did in order to become Buddhas. The Buddha came to this world to show us exactly what he did in order to become a Buddha. And we have all of that information in front of us. And right now we're engaging in the specific activities that will be necessary for us to achieve that goal that Buddha has for all of us, which is Buddhahood. So Buddha Shakyamuni is so pleased. Now imagine that Buddha Shakyamuni has been containing all of the holy beings in the merit field. Imagine now that all of a sudden, like fireworks, you see the entire merit field explode into the space in front of you. You see His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, everyone's so happy and so animated. You see Kensar Geshe Wandak. We remember his smile. We remember how much he connected to us and taught us over and over and over again these teachings for beings of three capacities. We're so fortunate to be connected to beings like His Holiness, like Kensar Geshe Wandak. We imagine Geshe Lopsang Gompo, imagine Demolocho Rinpoche, and imagining uh, the, the previous uh, Kensar Rinpoche Gen Gyatso, imagining Geshe Dorje Damdu, Umzula Geshe La, Eche Geshe Agala. Geshe Mala Tenzin Ladrin La. We're so fortunate we have these beings who are willing to spend so much time with us, spend so much time explaining the Dharma uh, so that we can advance on our path. And they see that here we are taking it upon ourselves to come and do something about our bliss, uh, future bliss and future fearlessness. Uh, and they're so happy imagining they're all right there. Jeffrey Hopkins, Lama Alan Wallace, Dupton Children, Lama Zopa Rinpoche, any beings that you consider holy beings, Genpal Dendrava Rinpoche, all these beings that we still have in this world. We're so, so fortunate. Now imagine all the beings of the extensive deeds lineage passed down from Buddha Shakyamuni to Matreya and Asanga and Dharmakirti and Dignaga and, and, and uh, Basubandhu, I'm sorry, Dharmakirti and Dignaga. Uh, Asanga, Basubandhu, Dharmakirti, Dignaga, Guna Prabha, Shakya Prabha, Vimukta Sena, Hari Bhadra, uh, you see Lama Salimpa and Atisha, all those holy beings of the extensive deeds lineage that elucidated the grounds and paths uh, and the Vinaya and logic and reasoning 
uh, and Lamas Olympus sits in that lineage where we, we see that incredible teaching uh, that relates so much tonight's, to tonight's talk of the seven point cause and effect for realizing the mind that aspires to enlightenment. Uh, where we see that all sentient beings are our mother, remember their kindness, wishing to repay their kindness, love through the force of attraction, great compassion, the extraordinary attitude and the result of bodhicitta that we've learned so much about. We see that we're so connected to these beings because we know exactly what those words mean that I just said. And the only reason that we know the, what those words mean is because of great beings like Matreya and Asanga and Haribhadra and Vimukta Sena. This is the reason that we know about these various ideas about getting bodhicitta, the various ideas about the various paths of accumulation, preparation, seeing, meditation, and no more learning. It's because of these beings of this extensive deeds lineage. Now imagine the beings of the profound view lineage passed down from Buddha Shakyamuni to Manjushri and Nagarjuna and Buddha Palita and Arya Deva and Chandrakirti and Shanti Deva and Baba Vega and Chandrashita and Kamala Shila all of these holy beings in this lineage, this Madhyamika lineage that explains what the Buddha meant at the second turning of the wheel of Dharma by all things, all phenomena are empty of inherent existence. And Nagarjuna clarifies that so much. Chandrakirti clarifies everything that Nagarjuna said even more. And then Lama Tsongkhapa was so kind to clarify it even more to us. And so many great bandits clarify it even more to us. We're imagining all of those beings, including, including Lama Salimpa again, because Lama Salimpa taught that incredible teaching of equalizing and exchanging self with others uh, to Lord Atisha. And we find that teaching in the profound view lineage. So we see even Lama Salimpa being part of both of these holy lineages of extensive deeds and profound view lineage by way of the teachings on bodhicitta that he passed down then to Lord Atisha that land in our lap. We're so fortunate to know of the equalizing and exchanging self with others practice, uh, where we see the importance of all sentient beings, the downfalls of cherishing ourselves, the, the benefits of cherishing others, uh, the giving and taking practice of love and compassion. We see this actual exchange that goes on uh, where we actually exchange this idea where we want to put others' needs before our own. We remember the incredible kindness that everyone's shown us, and we, we look to take on this extraordinary attitude, just like in the seven point cause and effect to realize the mind that aspires to enlightenment, uh, where we say, I'll take on my task, this task of freeing all sentient beings, we realize we can't, we must achieve bodhicitta in order to do that. These two incredible lineages that we know so much about are because are, are, are in our, have come to our ears and our hearts because Lama Atisha took a very long boat ride to Indonesia and met with Lama Salimpa and learned these two lineages of instruction of bodhicitta. And we have these teachings in our world. And then Lord Atisha took the teachings of the Madhyamika Prasangika and clarified it so much and integrated all these paths so clearly and passed the entire Lamrim tradition down to the next person we see in this space in front of us, Drone Tompa, the, the holder of the Lamrim lineage, that holy lay Lama. We see the, the lineage of blessings, the lineage of practice, uh, in the space in front of us, passed down from Vajradhar and Sharaha and Matripa and Talopa and Naropa and Marpa Lotsawa and Mila Repa and Gampopa. All these holy lineages that have been passed down. The three Kadampa lineage masters, the, the masters of Nyingma, Kaju, Sakya and Galup, such as Padmasambhava, Sakya Pandita, the Karmapas and Lama Tsongkhapa, Lama Tsongkhapa's disciples, Kirtup Jay and Jelsup Jay and Panchen Son Andrapa. And we see the great masters like Basu Chiji Jetson and Jayan Sheba, Janjai Rubi Dorje, Seventh Dalai Lama, all these holy beings, all the holy beings of the highest Yoga Tantra, Yoga Tantra, Performance Tantra and Action Tantra, the beings of the 35 Buddhas. We know from Rinpoche's commentaries and all the great commentaries that just by saying the names of these Buddhas and paying homage to them, we get rid of eons of non-virtue. Such an incredible blessing that we know of these ways of purification. We know that if we use the four opponent powers, if we engage in a negativity, in negativity and we firmly face and avert it, that we have a tool to use to purify the negativity right away. And the 35 Buddhas are such powerful uh, um, basis for us to engage in the power of antidote with by reciting their names. We're so fortunate that we know about this and we know how to connect all of this to the teachings, connect it through the Lam Rim, connect it to the, our understanding and our, because if we can do that, then we can make it to Buddhahood quicker. 
imagining all of the protector deities, the protector deities of the small scope, imagining Vaishravana, medium scope, and Dharma, Pala, Dharma, Dharma Raja, uh, Kalaputra, and, and the great scope, Mahakala, and the, all the Dharma Palas, and Paldan Lama, imagining them all in the space in front of you. Now we recognize that we've been given so many gifts by all these holy beings, and that we know how to get rid of suffering. We just have to engage in it. We know how to have bliss. We just have to engage in it, in the practices that achieve that. And the only way that we can become Buddhas is by helping all sentient beings, by loving and caring for all sentient beings. We have to bring this into our hearts. We know that by the seven point cause and effect for realizing bodhicitta practice. And we know that by the practice of equalizing and exchanging self with others. And we know that we come to the conclusion that we must become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings so that we can become the most reliable guides in the universe. What are we guiding? We're guiding sentient beings from wherever they are at to the state of Buddhahood. So that's exactly what the Buddhas are doing for us. So we're going from where we're at, hopefully, uh, quickly to the state of Buddhahood. And we're being guided by Buddhas, teachers like His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Kensar Geshe Wandak in a way that will help us get there as quickly as possible. We will eventually become those supreme guides that will be able to help all sentient beings get to Buddhahood as quickly as possible. But in the meantime, we have to do what we can. We have to generate in our mind stream these ideas uh, so that they actually come to fruition. This idea that I want to become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings and that I need to connect with all sentient beings. So this idea that I need to become a Buddha that now is almost you know, kind of at a, a very shallow level uh, will then actually turn into this thought that doesn't go away day and night. But it has to start kind of in this shallow place uh, where we're just kind of saying it, uh, we're just kind of kind of meaning it. Uh, and then it will bring it to a larger place. So another way that we can do that is now imagine that how could we help all sentient beings if we were Buddhas right now? Uh, we would bring them to a place or that they could be able to hear the Dharma, that they'd be able to you know, hear the stages of the path that are necessary for everyone to engage in in order to become Buddhas. So we imagine that we uh, are a reliable guide right now. And we do in our imagination, we imagine that we start to connect with every single being in the universe and start bringing every one of them here. Uh, all of those beings that uh, are still uh, trying to get rid of the afflictive obstructions and the obstructions to omniscience uh, uh, are all here uh, in our minds. Uh, and we're bringing them here and leading them in these prayers and leading them in these thoughts uh, and, and somehow we've brought them here and all the suffering and all the commotion of their minds uh, has stopped for a moment uh, and they're able to hear these teachings. So this is the best we can do right now. So we imagine we bring all the hell beings, hungry ghost beings, the animals, the humans, the demigods, the gods, all these different varieties of beings uh, that uh, um, exist in the universe. Uh, and we're imagining as many as we possibly can, as many uh, you know, it, it, as like atoms, you know, in the imagining, you know, because there's, you know, countless sentient beings. And we learned that countless means like uh, 60 zeros. <laughs> so there is a number, <laughs> but it's got 60 zeros. Uh, so, you know, uh, when we use those terms, uh, um, sometimes uh, it, it, can, it can mean a definite number. Um, but in this case, it isn't necessarily even referring to a definite number, like that specific def definite number, because the number is always changing because sentient beings are becoming Buddhas. So we couldn't say there's a fixed definite number, because then we would say there's not Buddha nature <laughs> if it's in, in terms of this. But we, we can't even imagine is a better way to put it in terms of sentient beings, the numbers of countless sentient beings. We're imagining we're bringing them all here. Now all the gurus and buddhas and bodhisattvas are so pleased uh, and so happy uh, that everyone's here. Nobody's fighting. There's no bias. Everybody's here for one purpose. And that's the purpose that the Buddhas come to this world for. Uh, uh, and that's to, uh, bring a, to show us how to engage in a pathway uh, to become the happiest beings in the universe like they are. <laughs> Uh, so out of their love and their compassion, they come here to show us how to, you know, become the most, you know, happiest, 
loving, compassion beings in the universe. Um, so with that, uh, we're going to read um, and we're going to imagine that, of course, all sentient beings are reading uh, this all with us, a uh, 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 homage to Buddha Shakyamuni called the drumbeat of truth, the supplication to Shakyamuni Buddha uh, called the Dembing Ngatra uh, by His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama. Uh, and then we're going to read the prayer to the Nalanda Pandits, also written by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Uh, and then I'm going to read, there's a short thing right after it about why His Holiness the Dalai Lama wrote it. Uh, and then we'll do the Heart Sutra. So uh, we're just doing things the way we're doing things. <laughs> so imagining that you and all sentient beings that you're leading, that you have brought to this place are reciting, if you have the text, probably not, but hearing these words, you know, really meditate on these words. I won't read them a million miles an hour. Really meditate on these words and imagine that all sentient beings are doing that. Uh, and you're, supp you're making supplication to Buddha Shakyamuni. So you have the merit field and Buddha Shakyamuni. And you can imagine that even the merit field is supplicating uh, Buddha Shakyamuni uh, because the, old, the teacher of Nagarjuna is Buddha Shakyamuni <laughs> in terms of lineage. When we look at passed down from this teacher to that teacher, uh, there was no new dharma that Nagarjuna made up. This was Buddha Shakyamuni's teaching. Uh, so all of these great beings imagining them bowing as we're doing this also to Buddha Shakyamuni out of uh, a, sh a show of respect. Um, uh, and there's like an, a, a mutual respect. You would see this amongst the high lamas uh, that they would have just kind of like, yeah, I know, me too. <laughs> this mutual respect that you would see these holy beings would have I don't know if it's mutual respect or mutual realization, uh, or they, you know, they've gotten to similar places, but you could really see them connecting in this way of admiration to each other. Um, so you can imagine that not only you and the sentient beings who are looking to get out of samsara, but also the holy beings are paying homage to one another out of respect. Okay, so it's called the drumbeat of truth. And this is one of the texts that uh, Nejong Oracle uh, said that people should be reciting uh, for the benefit of Tibet, for the benefit of all sentient beings, for the, you know, the Dharma in the world to stay here, uh, and so forth. And just out of reverence to Buddha Shakyamuni, uh, who we know is our teacher, um, our teachers, 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 etc. teacher to 2,600 years ago. Uh, so this is the, our family lineage in terms of spirituality. Uh, and it goes back to Buddha Shakyamuni. And then, of course, Buddha Shakyamuni. There were Buddhas before Buddha Shakyamuni. We have Kashapa before Buddha Shakyamuni and Buddhas before that. Um, we, know, we know this. Uh, but the Buddha of our time, where we have the literature that we study, is Buddha Shakyamuni. Uh, uh, so here we'll pay homage to our founder, our teacher, the Bhagavan. Okay. Drumbeat of Truth, the supplication to Shakyamuni Buddha, Buddha by His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama. Maybe this is easier. I bow to you, the liberator, line of Shakyas, who perfected all ultimate qualities of omniscience and compassion, who has been pra praised as the white lotus, the protector of all beings, who dispels all suffering through the teachings of dependent arising. As you prophesied and foretold through your glorious speech that your teachings would spread in a northerly direction, the entirety of the teachings of the conqueror spread throughout the land of the snows, becoming an ornament and a sign of good fortune for the world. However, Due to the force of unwholesome deeds, today the teachings of the conqueror have declined. Oh, greatly compassionate one, the time has come to bestow protection with compassion. The environment and being spent and drained through unending sufferings are on the brink of extinction. Thus, the entire human and celestial population of the land of snows is drawn together out of intense faith, solidarity, and altruism to offer this ornamental crown protrusion of refined gold this supreme alms bowl of a sage and these saffron fine robes. Whatever extensive collection of merit and wisdom results from these offerings, as well as all the heaps of virtue of the three times, I dedicate to the conqueror's teachings, the source of all peace and happiness for all beings, including the celestials. So the teaching will not decline, but will abide for a very long time. For all sentient beings within the expanse of space, and in particular, all beings of this continent, called Jambu Viva, may loving and compassionate thoughts and deeds prosper and violent co conflict cease forever. Having dispelled all inner and outer obstacles and downfalls, 
such as poverty, despair, oppression, cruelty, epidemics, and natural disasters due to the environmental degradation. May all beings forever enjoy the glory of peace and happiness, inseparable from the precious radiance of appreciating others' good qualities, recognizing mutually close ties and friendship, and maintaining an unbiased attitude towards all who follow Buddhist and non-Buddhist traditions. May I voluntarily enact deeds solely for the benefit of all sentient beings, especially in the refreshingly cool land. May the degenerated teachings of the conqueror be restored and prosper without decline. And with the renewed peace and joy of spiritual and temporal freedom, may the inter immediate and long-term aspirations of the Tibetan people be quickly filled. May all those individuals whose service has contributed to keeping the banner of spiritual te and temporal deeds aloft in the land of the snows continue to shoulder their responsibility with a dedicated spirit and informed mind. May they be looked after in life after life by the holder of the lotus. In the realm of the Dharma, may the heaps of irreligious deeds be dispelled by the truth in all positive temporal and spiritual activities, which are altruistically motivated, be quickly fulfilled in accord with the Dharma. By the truth of the Dharma, may everything sacrilegious come to an end. The Kalafan, this supplication prayer I offer before the Supreme Buddha image at the supremely sacred place of Bodhagaya. I have here focused upon the general and specific matters concerning the well being of sentient beings and in the flourishing of the teachings composed by the Buddhist bhikshu Tenzin Gyatso, the Dalai Lama, in the Tibetan year 2131, 15th day of the 12th month of the wood monkey year. May it be thus fulfilled. Okay. Beautiful. And now it's another uh, poem, work <laughs> written by His Holiness the Dalai Lama called The Sun Illuminating the Threefold Path. Uh, and many of us have read this a lot because it's in the Chen Rezig Center prayer book. Um, I don't know if the translation is exactly the same or not, but I'm using this translation. Uh, um, so uh, I'm sure it's the same one. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's, it's the same one, but uh, if it's a little off, I apologize. I just wanted to let you know I'm using a different book, I'm using the blaze of non-dual bodhicitta uh, from the Tibet house, um, which is, wow, a serious <laughs> compilation text. Well, just, it's incredible what they've done and how many holy works they've gotten into this text uh, to help all of us uh, to be able to uh, have more and more wisdom. And the more wisdom we have, uh, the more we can interpret, the more that we can analyze, and then the more we can, you know, meditate on. Uh, so again, this is the sun illuminating the threefold path, praise to the 17 Nalanda masters by His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama. <clears throat> Born from great compassion, Aspiring to help all beings, God of gods, you have attained the savior state of abandonment and realization, and you guide beings through the discourse of dependent origination. O oh, Buddha, the son of speech, I bow my head to you. I implore you at your feet, O oh, Nagarjuna, most skilled in elucidating suchness free of elaborations. The meaning of the sutras, the mother of the conquerors, through the profound reasoning of dependent origination, in accord with the conqueror's prophecy, you initiated the middle way, the supreme vehicle. I implore you, O oh Bodhisattva Arya Deva, the chief disciple of Arya Nagarjuna, most learned and realized, who has crossed, crossed the ocean of Buddhist and non Buddhist tenet systems and is the crown jewel among those who uphold Nagarjuna's treatises. I implore you, O oh Buddha Bhalita, who has reached the supreme adept state and who has clearly elucidated Arya Nagarjuna's intent, the final meaning of dependent origination, the profound point of mere designation and a mere label. I implore you, O oh Master Baba Vega, most accomplished pandit, you initiated the philosophical tradition wherein while negating the extremes of truly existent things and arising and so forth, you uphold commonly verified knowledge and external reality. I implore you, O Chandrakirti, who disseminated all the paths of Sutra and Tantra. You are most skilled in teaching the profound and the vast aspects of the middle way, the union of appearance and emptiness dispelling the two extremes by means of dependent origination that is mere conditionality. I implore you, O Bodhisattva Shantideva, 
skilled at revealing to the assembly of fortunate spiritual trainees, the excellent path of compassion that is greatly wondrous through a multitude of reasoning, most profound and vast. I implore you, O oh, Master, Abbot, Shandarashita, who initiated the tradition of the non-dual middle way in accordance with the trainee's mental disposition, you are versed in the reasoning modes of both middle way and logic, and you disseminated the conqueror's teaching in the land of the snows. I implore at your feet, O oh, Kamala Shila, you who, having explained excellently the stages of meditation of the middle way view, free of elaborations, and the union of tranquility and insight in accordance with Sutra and Tantra, flawlessly elucidated the conqueror's teachings in the land of the snows. I implore you at your feet, O Asanga, you who sustained by Maitreya were versed in disseminating excellently all Mahayana scriptures and taught the vast and who in accord and taught the vast path and who in accord with the conqueror's prophecy initiated the tradition of mind only. I implore you at your feet, O Master Basubandhu, you who, while upholding the systems of the seven Abhidharma treatises, as well as non-duality, illuminated the tenets of Vaibhashika, Sautrantika, and mind only. Foremost among learned ones, you are renowned as a second omniscient one. I implore you at your feet, O Dignaga, the logician, you who, in order to present the Buddha's way through evidence-based reasoning, opened hundredfold gateways of the system of logic and offered as a gift to the world the eyes of critical intelligence. I implore you at your feet, O Dharmakirti, you who understanding all the essential points of both Buddhist and non-Buddhist epistemology, brought conviction in all the profound and vast paths of Svatantrika and mind only, by means of reasoning, you are most versed in the teaching and the excellent Dharma, Svatantrika and mind only. I implore you at your feet, O Arya Vimuktasena, you who lit the lamp that illuminates the meaning of the ornament treatise, wherein the themes of the perfection of wisdom stemming from Asanga and his brother were expounded in accord with the middle way view, free of existence and non-existence. I implore you, O Master Hari Bhadra, who were, were prophesied by the conqueror as an expounder of the meaning of the mother, the perfection of wisdom, you elucidated the excellent treatise on the perfection of wisdom, the three mothers, in perfect accord with the instruction of the saver, Matreya. I implore you at your feet, O Guna Prabha, most excellent in both integrity and scholarship, who, having excellently distilled the intent of 100,000 disciplinary teachings, expounded the individual liberation vows flawlessly, according to the tradition of the Saravastivada Vadi Vada school. I implore you at your feet, O Shakya Prabha, supreme holder of discipline, who re reigned over the treasury of the qualities of the three trainings in order to disseminate the stainless Vinaya teachings for a long time. You excellently expounded the meaning of the vast discipline treatises. I implore you, O Joa Tisha, you having taught all the profound and vast traditions related to the words of the Buddha within the framework of the path of the persons of three capacities, were the most kind master disseminating the Buddha's teaching in the land of snows. Having thus entreated those most learned ornaments of the world, the excellent sources of wondrous and insightful teachings, may I be blessed so that my mind becomes ripened and free through the entreaty I have made with a mind unwavering and pure by understanding the two truths, the ontological reality, will, will we ascertain how through the four truths we enter and leave samsara. We will make firm the faith in the three jewels that is born of valid reason. May I be blessed so that the root of the path of liberation is firmly established within me. May I be blessed to perfect the training in renunciation and aspiration for liberation, the total pacification of suffering and its origin, as well as an uncontrived bodhicitta that is rooted in infinite compassion that wishes to protect all sentient beings. May I be blessed so that I may easily develop conviction in all the paths pertaining to the profound points of the perfection and Vajra vehicles by engaging in study, reflection, and meditation on the meaning of the treatises of the great trailblazers. May I in life after life obtain excellent births 
that support the three trainings and contribute to the teachings that equal the great trailblazers in upholding and disseminating the teaching of scripture and realization through engaging in exposition and meditative practice. May the members of all spiritual communities spend their time in learning, reflection, and meditation, shunning wrong livelihood through the pro proliferation of sublime masters. May the great for face of the earth be beautified throughout all time. Through the power of this supplication, may I traverse all the paths of Sutra and Tantra and swiftly attain the state of the conqueror's omniscience. Characterized by spontaneous realization of the two purposes, may I work for the welfare of all sentient beings as long as space remains. Here's the colophon. And this is Dalai Lama's writing this. Thus, with respect to the profound and vast aspects of the excellent Dharma taught by the blessed Buddha, these great masters of India, the land of the Aryas, referred to in the above lines, composed excellent treatises that opened the eyes of intelligence of no, numerous discerning individuals. These writings survive without degeneration to this day. Now approaching 2,550 years following the Buddha's Mahaparinirvana, still serving as treatises for study, critical reflection, and meditation. Therefore, remembering the kindness of these learned masters, I aspire with unwavering devotion to follow in their footsteps. Today in an age when science and technology have reached a most advanced stage, we are incessantly preoccupied with mundane concerns. In such an age, it is crucial that we who follow the Buddha acquire faith in his teachings on the basis of genuine understanding. It is with an objective mind endowed with a curious skepticism that we should engage in careful analysis and seek reasons. Thus, on the basis of seeing the reasons, we engender a faith that is accompanied by wisdom. For this, the excellent treatises on the profound and vast aspects of the path by the great masters, such as the well-known six ornaments and two supreme masters, as well as Buddha Palita, Vimukta Sena, and so on, remain indispensable. Even in the past, there was a tradition, tradition to have paintings of the six ornaments and the two supreme masters made on Tonka scrolls. To these, I have added nine more lineage masters of the profound and vast aspects of the path, commissioning a Tonka painting of 17 great panditas of the glorious Nalanda Monastery. And every remembers at the center, there were the 17 Nalanda pandits. Those were the pictures that Dalai Lama uh, gave, you know, his office, Dalai Lama gave to Rinpoche to put up, <laughs> gave to the center. Because he wrote this, he had these all made up. Uh, so this were always connected so much uh, to all of this. Um, uh, so yeah. Uh, um, in conjunction with this, I wanted to compose a prayer that expresses my heartfelt reverence for those most excellent learned beings. And in addition, some devoted individuals and spiritual colleagues also encouraged me to write such a piece. Thus, this supplication to the 17 masters of Glorious Nalanda entitled Sun Illuminating the Threefold Faith was written by the Buddhist monk Tenzin Gyatso, someone who has found an uncontrived faith in the excellent writings of these great masters and sits amongst the last rows of individuals engaged in the studies of these excellent works. This was composed and completed at Techen Choling Mont Dharmsala, Kangra District, Himachal Pradesh, India, and in the 2548th year of the Buddha's Parinirvana, according to the Theravada system, on the first day of the 11th month of the Iron Snake year, in the 17th Rabjung cycle of the Tibetan calendar, that is December 15th, 2001 of the Kama era, may goodness prevail. Yeah, we're so fortunate. Sutra of the heart of transcendent knowledge. So let me rearrange my situation here.
the Sutra of the Heart of Transcendent Knowledge. Thus have I heard, once the Blessed One was dwelling in Rajagri at Vulture Peak Mountain, together with a great gathering of the Sangha of monks and a great gathering of the Sangha of Bodhisattvas. At that time, the Blessed One entered the Samadhi that expresses the Dharma called Profound Illumination. And at the same time, Noble Avukateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, while practicing the profound Prajnaparamita saw in this way. He saw the five skandhas to be empty of nature. Then through the power of the Buddha, Venerable Shariputra said to noble Avogateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, how should a son or daughter of noble family train who wishes to practice the profound Prajnaparamita? Addressed in this way, noble Avogateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva said to Venerable Shariputra, O Shariputra, a son or daughter of noble family who wishes to practice the profound Prajnaparamita should see in this way. Seeing the five skandhas to be empty of nature, form is emptiness, emptiness also is form. Emptiness is no other than form, form is no other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, perception, formation, and consciousness are emptiness. Thus, Shariputra, all dharmas are emptiness. There are no characteristics. There is no birth and no cessation. There is no impurity and no purity. There is no decrease and no increase. Therefore, Shariputra, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no perception, no formation, no consciousness. No eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no appearance, no sound, no smell, no taste, no touch, no dharmas, no eye dot to up to no mind dot to, no dot to of dharmas, no mind consciousness dot to, no ignorance, no end of ignorance up to no old age and death, no end of old age and death, no suffering, no origin of suffering, no cessation of suffering, no path, no wisdom, no attainment, and no non attainment. Therefore, Shariputra, since the Bodhisattvas have no attainment, they abide by means of Prajnaparamita. Since there is no obscuration of mind, there is no fear. They transcend falsity and attain complete nirvana. All the Buddhas of the three times, by means of Prajnaparamita, fully awaken to unsurpassable, true, complete enlightenment. Therefore, the great mantra of Prajnaparamita, mantra of great insight, the unsurpassed mantra, the unequal mantra, the mantra that calms all suffering, should be known as truth since there is no deception. The Prajnaparamita mantra is said in this way, Te Yata Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasangate Bodhi so ha. Thus, Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, should train in the profound Prajnaparamita. Then the Blessed One arose from that samadhi and praised Noble Avogateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, saying, Good, good, O son of noble family. Thus it is, O son of noble family. Thus it is. One should practice the profound Prajnaparamita, just as you have taught, and all the Tathagatas will rejoice. When the Blessed One had said this, Venerable Shariputra and Noble Avogateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, that whole assembly in the world with its gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, rejoiced and praised the words of the Blessed One. So, of course, this is the Sutra of the Heart of Transcendent Knowledge, which is a, you know, the most condensed, is a very, is a, a very condensed sutra uh, that contains all of the content uh, implicitly uh, that we find in the 100,000 verse, 20,000 verse, 8,000 verse uh, Perfection of Wisdom Sutras. Uh, so here, this is a teaching that Buddha gave. Uh, we call it the second turning of the wheel of Dharma. Uh, and, and anyone who's taken the diploma course now, now uh, knows that you look at each of the turnings of the wheel of Dharma in terms of who's there, uh, uh, where it is, and what the subject matter is. So here, the second turning of the wheel of Dharma, uh, we see that the place that this teaching was given is in Rajgir, uh, Vulture Peak Mountain in, in India. Uh, so Rajagriha, it says here at Vulture Peak Mountain uh, in India, uh, and the target audience, who was the target audience of the teaching, the target audience were the Madhyamika philosophers. Uh, so we see that the second turning of the wheel expounds the final view of emptiness. Uh, the Buddha uh, expounds you know, what he really meant in, in terms of the nature of reality. Uh, and in the middle way school, we feel uh, that the second turning of the wheel of Dharma is the definitive uh, teaching that the Buddha gave. Uh, it's not something that's interpretable or provisional. It's the actual uh, um, um, teaching on the ultimate truth. Uh, and so therefore, since it's teaching in the ultimate truth, it's the definitive teaching. Um, and the Buddha meant what, what, what he said in terms of being definite that things, all phenomena are not inherently existent. So this, the target audience were those Madhyamika philosophers, philosophers who were able to comprehend the final view of emptiness. This is who Buddha was teaching this, uh, uh, you know, lack of inherent existence of all phenomena too. Uh, and the subject matter was the lack of inherent existence of all phenomena, that all phenomena are not truly existent. All phenomena are not inherently existent. All phenomena are not objectively existent. So when you see no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no appearance, the Buddha is not saying these things don't exist. The Buddha is saying, Let's look at their mode of subsistence. Let's look at how 
they would exist. So the Buddha is saying they do exist, they just don't inherently exist. Uh, and there's a difference, the Buddha says. Uh, so uh, um, this is something that we need to uh, be aware of. For some reason, the Facebook one is going uh, into low battery mode. Uh, so I don't know if it's not plugged in or something funny is happening. Um, so we're, we're dealing with multiple layers of technology uh, here. So it's important to know when we think about the turnings of the wheel of Dharma, uh, where was the first turning of the wheel of Dharma in, in uh, yeah, Sarnath, Varanasi, the second turning of the wheel of Dharma in Rajagriha, and third turning of the wheel of Dharma in Vaishali. Uh, so it's, it's nice to have a perspective on on what the target audiences are, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll go over more of that another time, um, but that it is how we look at it in relation to the Heart Sutra being the second turning of the wheel of Dharma, the place where it happened was in Rajagriha at Vulture Peak Mountain in India. The target audience were Madhyamika philosophers uh, and the subject matter was the lack of true existence of all phenomena, but implicitly uh, the entire Mahayana path uh, can be found uh, within uh, this Heart Sutra. And we find the entire Mahayana path even contained in the most summarized way in that mantra of the Heart Sutra, Teata Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasangate Bodhisoha, that mantra that expresses uh, um, all implicitly the five paths that are needed uh, to get to Buddhahood, uh, those, those, those various activities needed uh, to become a Buddha. Uh, and one recognizes though that those five paths uh, because the explicit material is about emptiness, are empty of inherent existence, because they are phenomena, all phenomena are empty of inherent existence. There's not a single thing that you can find uh, internally, externally, that has any kind of inherent existence. The mind doesn't have inherent existence, uh, even though some of the lower schools assert that it does. When we logically uh, look at it relate in relation to the second turning of the wheel of Dharma, even our Buddha nature, uh, is empty of inherent existence. And when we look at the bodies of the Buddha, we look at the natural Dharmakaya body of the Buddha. One of those things is the same thing that we possess, and that's the emptiness of the Buddha's mind. Uh, um, you know, this kind of, um, yeah. So it's the same emptiness of our mind uh, is the same as the emptiness is the Buddha, of the Buddha's mind. So one of the Buddha's Dharmakaya bodies is the when we say, you know, bodies, it's, we'll go, we can go over that in more detail another time, but when we look at the aspects of the Buddha, the, you know, the, you know, what the Buddha is made up of, you know, we have the consciousness of the Buddha, and then we have the uh, forms that can be emanated of the Buddha, and the consciousness is the, the Dharmakaya, and the consciousness is empty of inherent existence, the consciousness is free of the defilements uh, that we have, and that's the difference. The Buddha's mind is empty, uh, of inherent existence, but the Buddha's mind doesn't have the defilements. Our mind is empty of inherent existence, but it does have the defilements. Because our mind is empty of inherent existence, those defilements can be removed. Uh, and because the, the Buddha's mind didn't have inherent existence before he or she became a Buddha, uh, they could mature the, into the state of Buddhahood by removing the afflictive obstructions and the obstructions to omniscience, because there wasn't a solid concrete thing there that couldn't change. So the second turning of the wheel of Dharma, as Nagarjuna says, if emptiness isn't, is, isn't possible, nothing's possible. But because emptiness is true, everything is possible. Everything can happen. Not anything can come from anything, but meaning things can occur. Things can dependently originate. There can be causes and conditions and changes and collections, uh, making holes and so forth. Dependent origination can occur because things aren't fixed, they aren't solid, because of this emptiness that all things emerge from. And in, the, in this second turning of the wheel of Dharma, we find that things exist, but exist merely by designation. We have causes and conditions, collections and parts that are serve as a basis of designation that have no nestness from their own side, but they serve as a basis of designation for us to impute them as something and bring them into being through designation. So this is how we as Madhyamikas, uh, are those wanting to be Madhyamikas, uh, would say we refute the extreme of non-existence is saying, no, it exists. It comes into being subjectively. Uh, no, it's right there. The flower, I, that thing I just said is flowers right there. It comes into being uh, subjectively. Uh, we, we have a label of a flower. I have a generic image 
uh, of this flower that I've cataloged from other flowers and now made it more specific with this flower, depending on what I've eliminated in the perception <laughs> in relation to it. Uh, um, so we're saying, yeah, there is a there is a flower. It's just subjectively conventionally existent, but ultimately we can't find it when we try to move closer to where flower is, and we we say, is it just a name? No, there's a, you know there's a shapes, and then, you know we the well, shape is a name. When we start to try to extrapolate where flower is, uh, we find that it merely can come into being subjectively. Uh, because the flower that I'm seeing is my little special flower based on my karma, how I'm seeing it, the, how I'm discriminating it, how it makes me feel. Uh, it's something that, make, that I like a lot more when I look at it, makes me feel a different way and makes it have kind of a rosy hue to it. <laughs> Whereas something that I don't really like or it doesn't matter to me, it doesn't have that same kind of rosy hue to it. it, doesn't have that same kind of warmth and aura to it that draws me to it. My karma subjectively makes these things into all of what they are, not you know some of what they are, all of what they are. It puts together all of this data and this information uh, and then makes a decision that it's this based on you know, knowing this is the definition of what this would be. This all is happening very quickly, obviously. Uh, and then we're naming it as something and deciding that this thing that we're like, oh, this flower that we've just now named uh, uh, because we've you know, seen it in our mind like a picture, we're believing that, that that's it, that, that everything then is the way that I see it. But everything uh, is the way that I see it. And that is why... <laughs> It doesn't exist ultimately objectively. It only exists the way that I see it. So therefore it exists conventionally subjectively. But ultimately, because these two items, we, we can't even agree on the qualities sometimes of items. This thing's sweet, this thing's sour. I like this, this is delicious, this is disgusting. Uh, we, we find that these items don't have any kind of inherent nature until we, we give it to them. So they don't have any objective existence. We give it the objective existence in our minds. So therefore, it doesn't have objective existence. It has subjective existence. Uh, not to say there's no externality. It's just the externality that we're making into our reality is subjective, <laughs> if that makes sense. But ultimately, the findability, like Nagarjuna said, if the mirage was water, the closer you get to the mirage, the more the water would appear. You know, if if the chair or the collar dog or the flower just existed objectively, the closer you move to it, you wouldn't see atoms and then protons, neutrons, you would see flower. Uh, but the closer you move to it, the when you try to find flower, is flower shape, is flower color, is flower something separate than that? Uh, is it just the, is it all of that? You know, is it every part the flower? But then is this part of the petal, is that flower? If I take this off, why would somebody say that's a flower? No, they're gonna say it's a petal. But this petal then is on there as part of the entity that makes it flower. So we have to start to see that we're putting these ideas and concepts together in our mind and then deciding what they're labeled and then deciding how we feel about that thing we labeled. It's all a subjective interplay going on. Uh, so that's what the Heart Sutra is talking about. And there is nothing that's findable, nothing that doesn't have this emptiness of inherent existence when we start to analyze it uh, and we start to analyze it and get it to the point of our mind. Does our mind inherently exist? Does the subject that's meditating on the emptiness, is that subject empty? And that's when we start to really fall out of the plane without a parachute if we don't have firm philosophical basis uh, from which to study. Um, so anyway, I know that it's gonna take up all of the teaching for this introduction, but I, it doesn't matter to me at all. Uh, so uh, now we'll do Kala Jube Ne Jo Damba Ne Ngoje Du Jung Ayi Du Do Jen Du Babo Lama Yi Bu Jin Si Ne Sun Kandro Zo La Sha Ze Lo Aga Samara Te Shandara Samara Ebe 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 Aga Samara Te Shandara
Make a mandala offering as a request uh, for the teaching. We could have probably done it at the beginning. <laughs> Um, but now we have 10 minutes left, so let's make a mandala offering as a re request for teaching. The fundamental ground is scented with incense and strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this is a Buddha land and offer it. May all sentient beings enjoy this pure realm. Holy Lamas high, wrap the sky of your Dharma bodies in massive clouds of knowledge and love, and let them pour upon the earth of your disciples as we are ready, a shower of rain, the teachings deep. And wide, I send forth this jeweled mandala to you, precious Guru. Sanjay Chodan Soji Chonanla, Shanchu Badu, Dani, Jasuchi, Dagi, Dagi, Chushe, Jipe, Sonanji, Droda, Pencha, Sanjay, Druba, Sho, Sanjay, Chodan Soji, Chonanla, Shanchu Badu, Dani, Jasuchi, Dagi, Chushe, Jipe, Sonanji, Droda, Pencha, Sanjay, Druba, Sho, Sanjay, Chodan Soji, Chonanla, Shanchu Badu, Dani, Jasuchi, Dagi, Chushe, Jipe, Sonanji, Droda, Pencha, Sanjay, Druba, Sho. Enthused by great compassion, you taught the Immaculate Dharma to dispel all perverted views. To you, the Buddha, Gautama, I pay homage. If you're attached to this life, you're not a spiritual practitioner. If you are attached to samsara, you have no renunciation. If you're attached to your own self-interest, you have no bodhicitta. If there is grasping, you do not have the view. Okay. I know that was a very, very long introduction, but there were a lot of points that I wanted to get to. And I said to myself before class, and I'm going to do things a little bit differently. Uh, and read some different things and try to introduce uh, all of you uh, to some new information. And then hopefully it'll inspire you to go find the Dalai Lama's prayer to the 17 Alanda masters and go, you know, look at it yourself and get to know them, get to know them as I feel so fortunate to have gotten to know them. And that's only because of the kindness of Kensar Geshe Wandak and presenting us with Lama Tsongkhapa's great treatise on the stages of the path to enlightenment, because that text uh, is only possible because of the Nalanda Pandits and because of Buddha Shakyamuni's kindness, who we find this prayer first uh, paying homage to. Uh, so, you know, hopefully uh, you will, you know, look into the drumbeat of truth, supplication to Buddha Shakyamuni by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Hopefully you will look into the sun illuminating the threefold path, praise to the 17 Nalanda masters by uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Um, and then get to know those masters. What did they write? What did Chandrakirti write? What did Asanga write? You know, how does that relate to me? Uh, why is Jeff always saying, now imagine the profound view lineage and the extensive deeds lineage and the lineage of practicing blessings. Why am I saying that? How is connecting to these teachers going to help me? And when we start to see what these teachers taught, we see, oh, these are teachers I need to be connected to in order to be helped in a full way and understand in order to understand the full picture of the Buddha Dharma in order to not have uh, partial understandings or incomplete paths we need to look at the entire picture and all of these pandits had their fortes had their really really big skill sets you know some of them really did uh, uh, incredible jobs at clarifying Vinaya. Some of them gave in, did incredible jobs at clarifying grounds and paths. Some of them did incredible jobs uh, in working through that complex Madhyamika Prasangika view. Uh, incredible jobs of showing us how to get bodhicitta. Incredible jobs in showing us how to see the emptiness of our mind. So I hope that you can become more familiar with these great great pendants, because in order to read this text, which we won't even really get into, obviously, tonight too much, uh, I might just read it for auspicious reasons up to where we are at. I won't give any commentary on it tonight. But in order for us to read this and extract the meaning out of each and one of these verse, every one of these verses, we end up at the pendants. <sighs> we end up at the Nalanda pendants to know what these verses mean. We have to. There's no way. There's no choice. I mean, there's a choice. You could have partial instructions, <laughs> but if you don't want to have partial instructions and you don't want to just be like, you know, okay, that's fine. I'll believe whatever you say. If you want to cut and rub the teachings the way the Buddha said to, then you're going to need these great minds to be able to look at, compare, compare with where your mind's at, 
see how they could affect your minds uh, in order to uh, really, really uh, derive the full benefit um, out of this small poem. This small poem isn't enough uh, for you to understand the path. This small poem, though, is enough for you to use as your glancing meditation and then sit with each and every one of these stanzas and say, okay, what can I fill in there? In your mind, as you read these, you should stop at the end of the stanza and say, what details can I add in there? Because I've given a million of details about these, you know, about the Lama being the source of all the good and why this life of leisure and what's opportunity and do we have opportunity? Can you start in your own mind without me talking? Look at these stanzas and how many things can you pull out of it? How many different, you know, things in terms of numbers, the twos of this, the threes of that, the fours of that the six of this, the seven of that, right? There's so many different numbers you can even play with. Jeffrey Hopkins was saying, it's fun to do that sometimes. You know, you know, how many things have twos? How many things have fours? And you know, how many things that relate to this are divisions of two, of four, of three, et cetera, et cetera. So really looking at these stanzas, that's how you engage in analysis. You take the stanza, put it on a pole, and you look at it from every single angle around that pole that's in the center of your analysis. So. Uh, hopefully you're doing that. And hopefully by doing that, you're making your mind more saturated with stuff and your mind's working more like, not like, more like Lama Tsongkhapa's mind. That's your goal, right? Is, you know, I, the yogi, have uh, realized this. You seeking liberation should do the same. And, and Lama Tsongkhapa's abbreviated stages of the path. You know, I, the yogi, did this. If you want what I have, do this. You know, uh, so... That's, that's what we're trying to achieve. The mind that is the same qualities, not the same mind, because we have separate consciousnesses, but the same qualities as Lama Tsongkhapa's mind, who was aiming for the same qualities as Buddha Shakyamuni's mind. When you see the praise uh, of the Buddha Shakyamuni for, te for teaching dependent origination, that incredible homage. So, okay, that's enough Dharma out of me for tonight. I'm very happy though with the, the Dharma we <laughs> landed on tonight and what we've gone through. And I, I hope that everybody uh, is okay with uh, kind of a non-conformist style sometimes. Uh, because when I, I think of things that I want to present and, and it's a meaning of something hits me because of all the other studies I have going on or because of other studies or an old thing I remember, I just want to present it now because who knows, maybe I'll never teach a class again. Who knows? Or, you know, death will come, nothing can stop it. We don't know when we're going to die. The only thing that can help is Dharma. And if something comes into my mind, I think is helpful. Well, I'm here sitting in front of the camera. So uh, I'm the guy who's got to say it. And I don't know if I'm going to have time to ever say it again. So uh, I really think like this. And I really like even in my mind, I'll start to wrestle and say, should I go on about this right now? Uh, because, you know, I'm supposed to be doing this other thing. Um, but it, I owe it to you um, because you're listening to me uh, to give you everything that I think that I have to give. And that, that's what I, I try to do at each and every one of these teachings. And if it's a little like not falling into the exact box of ways everything is normally done, we have to let go of ordinary appearances anyway when we get to the highest level of the teaching. So uh, that's what we sh we're, we're going to have uh, to do. Um, so, uh, quickly, we're turning it around. We'll do the mandala offering and dedication prayer uh, for Thanksgiving for the teaching, even though we just requested it. Uh, it's okay. Uh, all we're doing right now in this little one and a half hour, two hour session, however, whichever it is, Thursday's one and a half hour, Sunday's uh, uh, two hours, is trying to kind of play with ideas on how we would practice, get some ideas on what we would do for our practice. I can't do your practice for you. you I can give you some ideas. And go, you go off and practice, you know, <laughs> you know, and then hopefully you'll go realize it high enough that then you go into, in, into the woods, <laughs> you know, go to solitude, my young child, as Lama Tsongkhapa says. Um, so we'll do the mandala offering. The foundation, uh, the fundamental ground is scented with incense and strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this is a Buddha land and offer it. May all sentient beings enjoy this pure realm. I dedicate whatever virtues I've collected for the benefit of the teachings and of all sentient beings, and in particular for the essential teachings of Venerable Lozandrapa forever. I send forth this jeweled mandala to you, precious guru.
And I think also in the time of the days of attention span and sound bites, you may be even looking only at 10 minutes of this thing. So I'm gonna make, make sure that I get impact into those minutes whenever I can. Uh, prayer for the flourishing of Lama Tsongkhapa's teachings. Though he's the father producer of all conquerors, as a conqueror's son, he produced the thought of upholding the conqueror's dharma in infinite worlds. Through this truth, may the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. When in the presence of Buddha Indraketa, you may, he made his vow, the conqueror and his offspring, praised his powerful courage. Through this, may the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish, that the lineage of pure view and conduct might spread. He offered a white crystal rosary to the sage who gave him a conch and prophesied, through this truth, may the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. His pure view free of eternity or destruction, his pure meditation cleansed of dark fading fog, his pure conduct practiced according to the conqueror's orders, may the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. Learned, since he extensively sought out learning, reverend, rightly applying it to himself, good, dedicating all for beings and doctrine, may the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. Through being sure that all scriptures, definitive and interpretive, were without contradiction, advice for one person's practice, he stopped all misconduct, May the conqueror Lozung's teachings flourish. Listening to the explanations of the three pitakas, the tripitaka, uh, the three baskets, realized teachings, practiced the three highest higher trainings, his skilled and accomplished life story is amazing. May the conqueror Lozung's teachings flourish. Outwardly calm and subdued by the hero's conduct, inwardly trusting in the two stages of practice. He allied without clash the good paths of sutra and tantra. May the conqueror Lozung's teachings flourish. Combining voidness explained as the causal vehicle with great bliss achieved by method, the effect vehicle, hard essence of 80,000 Dharma bundles, may the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. By the power of the oath-bound doctrine protectors, the, the ocean of the oath-bound doctrine protectors, like the main guardians of the three beings past, the quick acting Lord, Vaishravana, Karmayana, may the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. In short, by the lasting of glorious gurus' lives, by the earth being full of good, learned, reverend holders of the teaching and by the increase of power of its patrons, may the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. Any mistakes that I've made, may they be purified by Vajrasapa's mantra and may anything that you've heard uh, wrong or I said wrong and you heard, may it be purified by Vajrasapa's mantra. Imagine Vajrasapa is inseparable from your root teacher, uh, inseparable from Kensu Geshe Wandak and imagining white light rays and nectars transforming into ohms, purifying your body, red light rays and nectars transforming into Oz, purifying your speech and blue right, light rays and nectars, uh, transforming into blue homes and purifying your mind uh, and imagining they're coming from Vajrasapha, who's inseparable from the root guru. Om Benza Sato, Samaya Manu Balaya Benza Sato, Zena Vajija Dida Meva Vazu Dugaya Meva Vazu Bogaya Meva Vazu Bogaya Meva Vazu Meva Vazu Meva Vazu Meva Meva Vazu 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 Meva Ah, home fate. May we always be protected by Paul and Lama, who Rinpoche said is our protector deity. Jarama 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 Jinjagala Raja Morama, which is that you turn your river the Hong Jo Hong. Jarama 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 Jinjagala Raja Morama, which is that you turn your river the Hong Jo Hong. Jarama 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 Jinjagala Raja Morama, which is that you turn your river the Hong Jo Hong. Jarama 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 Jinjagala Raja Morama, which is that you turn your river the Hong Jo Hong. Jarama 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 Jinjagala Raja Morama, which is that you turn your river the Hong Jo Hong. Jarama 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 Jinjagala Raja Morama, which is that you turn your river the Hong Jo Hong. Jarama I dedicate all this virtue to emulate the knowledge of the hero Manjushri and likewise Samantabhadra as well. With whatever dedication is praised to Supreme by the conquerors who traverse the three times, I also dedicate all my roots of virtue for the sake of auspicious deeds. In that pure land surrounded by snowy mountains, you are the source of all benefit and happiness. All powerful Avogateshvara Tenzin Jatso, may you stay until samsara's end. We'll do the prayer for Kensu Geshe Wandak. A complex yogi poses as a simple monk. Homage to Kensu Geshe Wandak Rinpoche, our precious spiritual friend who is inseparable from Arya Tara. I fully prostrate covering as many atoms of the earth as possible to your pure body, speech, mind, and enlightened activities. I offer to you drinking water, bathing water, flowers, incense, candles, scented water, food, and music purified by Om. Ah, Om. The rarity of having one million wish-fulfilling gems is a common occurrence compared to meeting with a holy teacher like you who placed the complete path to Buddhahood in our childlike hands. 
Just like Atisha who came to Tibet with a lamp to dispel the darkness of ignorance, you kind abbot arrived in the West with a lineage purer than a diamond and begged us never to be satisfied with partial instructions. The teachings of the extensive deeds and profound view lineages flowed from your lips like nectar for our ears that elucidated the teachings for beings of three capacities. Now the sound has stopped, all composite things are impermanent. You told us that all of your teachers passed away and understood this sadness, entreating us to continue our studies. The Buddha does not wash away the negativities of beings, nor does he remove their miseries with his hands. His spiritual realizations are not transferred to them. It is by teaching the truth of suchness that beings are liberated. We are not prepared to take this difficult journey to the highest goodness of Buddhahood without your continued guidance. The sadness in our hearts would be too overwhelming. May you swiftly return to this world and take care of us in all of our lives, wherever we may be, never leaving our hearts and our crowns. May all sentient beings perfectly realize renunciation, bodhicitta, and the correct view of emptiness so they know who you really are. And for anybody, I see a bunch of people on the different platforms who doesn't know, uh, this is a prayer for Kenser Geshe Wandak, who was many of our root teacher, many of our people who are watching's root teacher. Uh, he was a retired abbot of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama's monastery, and was considered one of the greatest scholars uh, of his generation. And I had the uh, pleasure and honor uh, and luck <laughs> uh, of translating for him for over 20 years. Uh, and learned so much and translated, you know, so, so over a thousand teachings for him. Uh, and now I'm able to share this with you because of his kindness. So that's the reason we read this. He passed away on March 6th of 2022, uh, but Rinpoche is still with us uh, every moment of our lives, those of us who are so connected to him, uh, because we know the source of all our good is our teacher. So thank you. Uh, and thank you, Rinpoche. Uh, for allowing this to go on again and again and again. All right, take care, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching.